Hi, welcome to the panel section of our performance. My name is Bryden Vino, and I'm the program assistant with the Vancouver Adapted Music Society. Today, I'm joined by four fantastic artists. So starting on the end, we have Danny Sloan, also known as Digger Dan. Next to him is 77 Spokes. Next to him is Dave Symington. And lastly, Graham Wyman. So let's just hop in right into the questions. Uh, Dave, I'd love to start with you. Having st uh, been in accessibility advocacy for so long, co-founding VAMS, um, what does it mean to have a space that is accessible for musicians? And what does it look like to you? Wow, that's a big question, but it uh, pretty much means everything. If you're a performer, musician, artist, um, given that we started VAMS 35 years ago, roughly, uh, I mean, things have improved since then, but we're constantly fighting that battle of getting good space. And not just stage, not just audience. We're talking about backup house, we're talking about bathrooms, we're talking about access to the building and parking and the whole infrastructure around it. So it's critically important, obviously, yeah. Thank you, yeah. And uh, so, Danny, uh, you get to spend a lot of time out in the city busking. Um, and obviously, you've rigged up your wheelchair to have a uh, setup so that you can do this anywhere you go. Um, so kind of in the city of Vancouver, uh, what do you see uh, could be better or improved for accessibility? In the public grounds, um, I would say overall not bad because I'm, 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 I'm dealing with uh, you know, level entry and flat surfaces, and I'm, I'm dealing with uh, SkyTrain elevators and, you know, things that are already set up and designed. Um, certainly, separate from access, public music in Vancouver is fairly flimsy and weak. And, um, but that's a hard, that is a hard question, too, because I've never really imagined accessibility issues because I'm really trying to bypass the problem by, by busking. And I do bypass the problem by busking. And in a lot of ways, I'm sort of like the safety valve for the problem. Yeah. Thank you, yeah. So uh, 77 Spokes. Uh, as a solo artist, um, throughout the last year uh, with COVID, uh, obviously a lot of artists have had to kind of do more solo work. Um, did you find that during this time you were able to flourish or find new ways to write, new uh, thought processes, or maybe did you end up working with people you may have thought you didn't work with before? I have worked with a couple different producers. Uh, most recently, one of them is Dave right here. Uh, we've been working on some songs. So I've worked on, uh, uh, worked on uh, a bunch of songs, um, but I remember last year, I actually put out an album last year, and as COVID was happening um, throughout the first half of COVID, I guess, that album was finishing up and there was actually a four month period where I couldn't go to the studio. And I normally was going like uh, every month or two. Um, and I had songs that I was pumping out, trying to find the best ones for my album. And I couldn't go and I just, my writing kind of hit a standstill. That was kind of around the beginning of COVID. So there was about four months where it was at a standstill. And it's right, you know, I had been building the momentum for getting the album done. So it was just like suddenly the brakes were on and the whole world stopped. So I definitely felt that in my creative process. Um, but as far as writing, I've been finding, like even since I put out that album, I've been now putting out singles uh, pretty regularly since then. Like I put out, I think, three or four or maybe four or five uh, just in 2021 and those uh, have just been coming out of me naturally also as COVID is starting to end or we're coming to a new phase um, and it's getting better out there so I just feel inspired by that too so I'm starting to feel more inspired but it did hit a standstill for a while there. Interesting yeah no that's cool that um you kind of flipped how you like to uh, release your music going from that album um, concept more to the singles, um, which was probably more attainable in this time, right? It's, yeah, I'm doing that for now. Yeah, nice. I like that, yeah. Yeah, so Graham, um, 
For our viewers who may not know, Graham is the program coordinator for the Vancouver Adapted Music Society. Uh, so Graham, having uh, the opportunity to work with so many uh, artists, um, artists with disabilities specifically, um, what does it mean, uh, again, similar question to Dave, to have this space um, or to have accessible uh, performance spaces into the city? Well, I, I think at the end of the day, it gives, I mean, it's a sense of freedom for artists and it's a way to give expression back into what they do and what they love to do. I mean, the, the thing with venues in the city, I find most of the time, whether it's helping with shows, is that you'll have certain areas that are accessible. To give an example, a washroom may be accessible, however, the stage might not. And that could be the inverse. Maybe certain doorways are too, too um, tight. So VAMS has really put forward um, adaptations in the sense where we will bring ramps. Um, you know, a, a nice thing about the Roundhouse is it is the venue that we're at right now is it's a flat entrance. Or even when we do have a stage, there's always a ramp provided. Um, you know, it's, it's finding those venues, though, or it's, it's not easy within the city, for sure. Okay, so this is a question for the whole group, um, and I'll start with you, Graham. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's a big call for music right now, live music especially, um, and of course we haven't had some in so long. And venues around the city vary in type. Of course, we have big spaces like this, but then there's also like coffee shops um, and smaller venues like that. And then what is the different levels of accessibility um, in these different venues? Yeah, again, touching on what I kind of alluded to earlier is there's certain venues um, that, you know, are even just um, can sometimes be accessibility challenges for our viewership. People, a lot of um, the people who come out to see shows with VAMs are wheelchair users. Um, and long story short, you know, um, if, say, a venue has to be accessed by an elevator, um, we kind of do tend to stay away from those type of venues because again it can be a fire hazard um, although um, the CBC Studio 700 is a I'd say and I think all all of us have played there um, that's a fairly accessible venue with a and then you guys please touch on your points too yeah I think um, I think I just wanted to touch on yeah we're also talking about rehearsal space too and I know because the makeup of the panel is more, uh, you know, physical barriers we're talking about, but uh, we're certainly not limiting uh, our goals to that. So we want to make sure that it's all inclusive of sensory disabilities, different communication needs, different sensitivities around mental health and training staff, you know, and awareness and all that. Um, yeah, I think the way that we have approach things oftentimes just because of the lack of uh, diversity of accessible space in the city that we do the best to provide the access for them. And that's often what people do. They make compromises to, to use a certain space. And, you know, we know it's not ideal, but we'll use it because we have nowhere else to go. And, you know, we've been fairly fortunate that we've been using you know, places like the Roundhouse that are good and um, other smaller venues. But uh, when we're faced with a situation where there is an access, we either provide it or you, you can't play. And that goes with, uh, you know, studios and rehearsal spaces and, and so on. So this year has been a real challenge because we haven't had any rehearsal space for about a year. So when we play, we rehearse before we play the same day, more or less, so, which is not ideal, obviously. So, But a lot of people are struggling with that because of COVID, but it's an ongoing problem for musicians and artists with disabilities. So, Certainly, yeah. And um, Digger Dan or 77 Spokes, if there's anything you'd like to add to that, please. Um, in 2016, I, um, I started to uh, do this thing called an I called it Omar, the Open Mic Accessibility Report. And I went around to different venues. I went sometimes two to three a day. And I would just assess entrance, the entrance, um, the stage, the washroom. I can't remember if there's a fourth criteria. And I had it on my website for a while. And I 
and I wanted to redo it with pictures, so I never, um, so I wanted to upgrade, update it. And it, but it taught me an awful lot. Um, like I went to the Biltmore, for example, and Biltmore is a f phenomenal venue inside, you know, wide and spacious and huge, and, and not a really high stage. Uh, but the uh, access is through a sort of a, a poured concrete sort of log of of uh, concrete that goes down through a through a section of a cold room where all the kegs are, and if you were in a manual chair, you'd be like really dicey for you, you know. And so I would go to various venues and just sort of write up these little reports. I went down to the Savoy and just lots of them. I think it was about thirty of them in the end. And yeah, there's just a lot of problems and, and understandable. I mean, we're not a large group. Um, we're new on the relatively new to, to have our voices out. And uh, but so many of these things can be there's so many things that can be done for, you know, you know, under five hundred dollars, as they say, with most accessibility issues, you can do so many things with so little, you know, with just sort of slight modifications. But yeah, it was sort of certainly a wake up, you know. I might see the outside, you know, busking, looking friendly, but when you get into the venues, it's it's really a dicey situation. And I, I'm going to probably go back to that eventually, you know, and uh, redo it. So yeah, yeah that would be really cool. Gain yeah. some more insights on um, these, yeah, different venues around the city. Yeah, yeah, just go out with the camera and really get yeah. the get the complete thing, and then put it up on, on on a site, you know, so people can really prepare themselves even for when they would just want to go out and watch a show, you know. Because that's going to be that's as much as of a problem as there's also the attendees, as much as the uh, artists, you know. Yeah, and seventy-seven spokes. Anything to add? Maybe um, if you have anything, uh, just to share about um, what a space would look like to you to be able to perform in or rehearse in uh, that is fully accessible. What are some yeah. of the features that it might have? Sure. So I think the number one for me, being a wheelchair user, it's the washroom. So that's what I struggle with because, like most people, we would need to use the washroom several times in the course of an evening. And most places, I used to perform at several clubs, nightclubs in downtown Vancouver. And I also performed at pubs. I also performed at pubs, and um, they weren't accessible when it comes to the washroom. And it wasn't like everyone is saying. It's the entrances, it's the stage, it's those things. But for me, it really, it would be to have a wheelchair accessible washroom that is separate from the uh, unis, I mean, uh, the, yeah, the, the, what I mean to say is like the, the men's washroom or the women's washroom, so have a separate wheelchair washroom um, to go in, close the door and, and have space to move around. And uh, especially if using a power chair, it's hard to get up on stages. So it would be, uh, nobody can just lift you up because these chairs are heavy. So it would have to be like a flat stage or a little ramp. So I think it's already been said for the most part here, what everyone's saying, just those few things are the main highlights. Though if those were accessible, it would be way more inviting. I do want to touch on one thing that Dave kind of mentioned earlier. And that, again, that's why, um, before the pandemic especially, um, the VAM studio, which is located up at GF Strong Rehabilitation Hospital, is so important for you know, artists with disabilities because it is fully accessible and it, it's really, it's an invaluable space that we actually get to you know, have our creative, creative art you know, become reality. Yeah, no, and it's, it's still crazy to me to think that it's the only one in uh, Western North America uh, the only fully accessible studio. And having met so many artists with disabilities over the my time with VAMS, it's, it, it seems like it should be more common because there is so much talent uh, in every city, in every little town. Um, it's not just uh, able-bodied people that should have access to just life's simple pleasures, your goals, your dreams of being a musician. Um, so yes, the studio uh, is an amazing thing. And like a space like this, the Roundhouse, uh, um, with the ground level stage, uh, wide enough doors, uh, you can come right in. And it's, it's almost a no brainer that this is how uh, stages should be set up. Like, would you kind of agree like that? 
Yeah. Yeah, I would just add, like, you know, we're also, I think, looking at, obviously, we're talking as artists and performers, but let's say I wanted to be a lighting tech or, you know, work in the sound booth. You know, there's really, I don't know if there's any options for me to pursue that that path. So we're also talking about sort of the full, sort of on stage, behind stage, the whole venue, making it accessible, not just for somebody that uses a wheelchair, but obviously that's, yeah. Thank you everyone for uh, joining me in this panel and let's get to the show. <laughs>